Good morning, everyone. It's 11.55. Happy Sabbath. Uh, I'm really excited about this new series that we're about to get into. Uh, usually, I like just, I get a sermon prepped, I get ready to get hyped up, and when I get hyped up, I want to just bring the word and just preach it. Somehow, looking into this sermon, I just want to have a conversation with you. And um, it's because when you look into the Gospel of John, it's made up of a lot of conversations. And I've always said that a conversation is sometimes worth a thousand sermons. There's so much meaning and depth in a lot of the conversations that Jesus has with so many of these people that he encountered in the Gospel of John. And I'm so excited to get into this, uh, get into this series with you. Um, the only downfall about this series is we only have five weeks to do it. So we only, we're going to divide 21 chapters, but focusing on the main, the main points of John's gospel. And um, today is going to be an introduction into the book of John. We're going to look at some things about why are we even looking at the book of John? Is it necessary for us? Why four gospels? We're going to be looking from that angle and the gospel and the gospel in itself. And then we're going to divide uh, the gospel of John into four parts. Uh, both Angel and I will do the difficult task of trying to uh, bring to you uh, the gospel of John in about four parts, today included as an introduction. But the conversations that you find in the book of John, and if you're anything like me, I, I love listening to conversations. Uh, it's one of the things that make podcasts so um, interesting in today's day and age is like people like to listen to conversations, especially conversations that make you feel as if you're part of it. Especially conversation that makes you feel like you're at the table as well and you're actually able to interact with what's happening here. I think of conversations like the conversations that J.R.R. Tolkien and, and C.S. Lewis had. I love the conversations that they had between the years of 1932 to about 1936 because it was in that period that C.S. Lewis would become a Christian out of these conversations. And so we'll be looking at the Gospel of John. It's the same writer, I believe it is, the same writer, same author to the book that we had just looked at, which is the book of Revelation. Now there's a lot of debate over when these books were written. Uh, John, I believe traditionally, and I believe this to be true, is responsible for five books of uh, the Bible makes him the second most um, uh, makes him the second author to Paul, who writes the most uh, in the book. And so, according to what I believe, uh, it's the book of Revelation that he writes first. And when he's released from Patmos twenty years later, he's in Ephesus, and in Ephesus he writes the Gospel of John in eighty-five A.D. And then from around nineteen ninety-one to about a hundred to the time that he passes away. He writes his epistles, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. But around 85 AD, he writes his, uh, his gospel that we're about to look into. The earliest manuscript that we have is Papyrus 66, which was found in Egypt, dating around 200 AD. And so what you'll soon discover about many of the manuscripts of the New Testament, and the reason that I mention that, is because it makes the New Testament the most legitimate manuscripts that we have. The reason that I mention that is that it separates the manuscripts of the New Testament from any other manuscripts that we have to, say, support Plato and the Republic. Uh, Plato's dialogue, Socrates, and what would be known as the Apology, uh, the time span between any of these books is anything between 800 to 1,000 years. You have Julius Caesar and his, 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 his uh, diary records of his uh, campaign, in Gaul, which is modern-day France, um, we only have a limited amount of copies of these manuscripts, and again, the, the, the time span between them is anything between 500 to 1,000 years. When you look at the manuscripts that prove that the person of Jesus actually existed, uh, these manuscripts, the earliest one that we have, uh, debatable between Matthew and um, Matthew and Mark. Mark has the earliest Greek, but Matthew has an earlier one in Aramaic. 
Matthew is believed to have written his around 40 to 44 AD, whereas then you have Mark who's writing around 50, 51, still making it, the time span between them is like 25 years. Making the, 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 the evidences to prove the historicity of Jesus far, far more legitimate than any other manuscript that you can think of. I remember when I was presenting in Newcastle, Australia, about an hour, hour's drive outside of Sydney, I was, I was doing a campaign, uh, 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 an evangelistic crusade, and the second night I talk about the historicity of Jesus, and at the end of that session of the historicity of Jesus, a, a woman uh, approaches me, she knew that I was going to talk about the historicity of Jesus, so she printed out all these... Uh, all these articles from online talking to me saying, Rome, if you get the chance, I just want you to flip through all these articles. They prove that Jesus never really existed. And as I quickly flip through, you know, these articles, it's, it's what most lecturers do at university. When, before they even look at your paper, they want to look at your what? They want to look at your bibliography. They want to look at your sources. Because when you look at your bibliography and your sources, then you can tell whether the article is worth reading. The very first thing I started to do when I looked at her, her, her papers, that these articles that she printed out online, the very first thing I did was I quickly flipped through just so I could get to see the sources. And most of them, you know, are, are, are independent sources online by authors I know zero about. So before I even looked at it, I said to her, did you print these all out online? She said, yes. And then I said, I challenge you, I just want you to find me like a serious historian. A serious historian that doubts the existence of a person by the name of Jesus. I'd look into it. Dan Brown, I don't know if you guys remember the name, he wrote a, a book called The Da Vinci Code. And when he wrote the book, The Da Vinci Code, I, want, I wonder if you guys know that he really, he really wanted that book, The Da Vinci Code, to be, um, he wanted it to be under the category of non-fiction. In fact, he wanted to publish it under history. Uh, and for those of you who know where his book is found in the library today, it's found in fiction and it's found under novel. Now, he collected a whole bunch of data you know, to try and, basically the book is about this, these Knights Templars who used to, uh, back when, uh, just after the Third Crusade, uh, many of the Europeans would have these pilgrimages to Jerusalem and the Knights Templars had a way of taking people down to, to Jerusalem and um, taking them back home and they used to be paid, they used to get paid a lot of money to do this. And whenever they would take a pilgrimage uh, to Jerusalem, they were given what was left of Solomon's temple, hence the name the Knights Templars, and there they discovered something that we know nothing about. We know for a fact that they did find something in that temple. What they found is we don't know. Most historians believe that they may have found uh, the head of the, the spearhead that pierced Jesus aside. Other speculations say that it, they, that he found the Abrahamic stone and sold it to the church. Whatever it was, we don't know. But whatever they found made them rich. Dan Brown leans towards the idea that he found a document that proved that Jesus was in fact married to Mary Magdalene. Now that's a whole other story that I don't want to go down. The fact is this. You can write whatever you want to write about Jesus, but you will be hard-pressed to find a serious historian, both secular, both believer, both an atheist, that actually doubts the person of Jesus Christ didn't exist. Many of them believe that he has existed as a person, which is why there's a quote that I, uh, that I can't remember off the top of my head, but it says, there's no, and it's done by F.F. Bruce, he says, there's no serious historian that is willing to put their reputation on the line to say that Jesus never existed. No one is willing to go down that path. And one of the best things about the fact that Jesus actually, exist, actually existed is that embedded in the story of Jesus, 
is a story that we're all familiar with. It's a story that we all love. It's a story that speaks to our heart. And many of those who are against Christianity are not against Christianity because they've read the book and then discovered that they don't like it. Most of the atheists that I've ever had to work with dislike the book because of those who represented it. All they have to do, that, and it comes up all the time in conversations, look down the tunnel of history, look down, you know, to, to, to what uh, the atrocities committed by the church. They talk about the Inquisitions, they talk about the Crusades, they talk about all these things, and yet when you go back to the person of Jesus Christ, you couldn't put one thing on Jesus Christ that said that he took a life, that he was envious or jealous. Even his enemies didn't have anything foul to say about Jesus Christ. The biggest problem that his enemies had was Jesus' claims. There's a conversation that took place between C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien and they're having this conversation about myths and legends. Both C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, if you don't know who they are, C.S. Lewis is the one that wrote the story, The Chronicles of Narnia. J.R.R. Tolkien is the one responsible, responsible for The Lord of the Rings. Both these guys uh, were studying um, myths and legends, particularly Norse myths and legends, in Oxford. And in this conversation, J.R.R. Tolkien turns to C.S. Lewis and he says to Lewis, Lewis, Jesus is just like any other mythical character that you can think of. Except Jesus actually lived. Jesus is like any other mythology except Jesus is real. And that set Lewis on a journey because it just... It, 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 his mind was ex it just exploded when he thought about it. Jesus is a real myth. What does it mean that something is real or something, and, and, and when something is true? Anyone that has read any of Shakespeare's stories seriously cannot walk away from Shakespeare's stories and say, even though it's not true, that it's not real. There's something real about these stories. And when you look into the stories of the Old Testament and the New Testament, people get stuck over whether they can prove these stories were actually true. Stop from trying to pursue that and actually read the story and tell me that these stories aren't real of human nature. Tell me that these stories are not real about are there something about these stories that has survived for thousands of years. And, and, and it makes me think because there's, there's two types of truths, right? There's the truth that emerges from, from, from historical and, and scientific and, and archaeological facts. And, and then there's truth that shapes kingdoms, civilizations, the hearts of men and women, from commoners to kings. And perhaps that's the most important truth of them all. And here you have these stories. And, and, and when you read these stories, how many of you here know James Cameron? How many of you here know J James Cameron? James Cameron, Cameron just has no time for Christians. He doesn't like them. He has no time for Christians. But have you seen his movies? Have you watched any of James Cameron's movies? There's the Terminator about, uh, uh, in, in, in about an enemy that goes after the woman. And when he goes after the woman, failing to kill the woman, because basically he wants the woman for the child of the woman. Because the child of the woman is going to bring about salvation. The title of his movies were called The Terminator Judgment and then Terminator Salvation. And, and then he... He, he goes ahead and tells this blockbuster movie called the Titanic, which, by the way, has not been beaten with the amount of money that, that poured in because of the movie Titanic. 
about this girl who falls in love with this unknown guy. They meet at the back where her arms are open like a cross like this. And she meets this guy who then at the end of the movie when she dies, she goes, I don't know who he is, but he saved my life. It's like it's our story. And James Cameron loves our story. Have you seen Avatar? About a human being that takes on the form of these aliens in order to save them. It's, a, it's our story. I mean, how many of you guys have ever seen uh, Disneyland's uh, Jungle Book? There's that part at the end of the movie where, 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 where the kid gets saved by the bear, and the moment the bear saves him, he, he, the bear turns around and says, there's no greater love than he was willing to lay down his life for a friend. Now that doesn't sound like Kipling to me. At all. I mean, these stories, right? It's the story of God. It's the greatest story ever told. The story of Jesus revealing the Father. And you go into 1 John chapter 1. It's, it's, it's in alignment with, with, it's in alignment with three books. It's in alignment with Genesis. Because the moment John says, in the beginning, all Jews go, I know where this is going. And then when he says, is the Logos, all the Gentiles go, I know where he's going. You know who John's audience is. But there in the story, he answers also to Isaiah because in Isaiah, he says, we shall see his glory. In John, we have seen his glory. It puzzled me when I first read um, the, uh, the faces of the ancient Oriental East. And at the end of that book, the last God to be explored is the God of the Hebrews. And the God of the Hebrews is the only God in the ancient world that doesn't have a shrine. It doesn't have a building. It's a whole other topic. God was the only one that couldn't be held. He beheld him, and let me tell you this. Without the gospel of John, without the gospel of Mark, without the gospel of Matthew and the gospel of those, and even the gospel that you teach regarding your testimony of Jesus Christ, without all of that, the world will never get to know who Jesus is. But the only reason we know of Jesus Christ is because Jesus Christ revealed himself to us. Not that we climbed the highest mountain, look for all the answers of the deep and meaningful things of life, and we discovered it. No, we would never have discovered it had not Jesus Christ revealed it to us. God, we could not comprehend him, save Jesus. It's the equivalent of, it's, it's the equivalent of Hamlet trying to understand Shakespeare. How will Hamlet ever get to know Shakespeare? And the answer to that question is, is if Shakespeare himself writes himself into the story, halfway through the Hamlet story, he's in Denmark panicking about what's about to take place, and Hamlet is worried about his life, and then out of nowhere walks in this guy with green tights and a little funny-looking mustache, and he says to him, Hamlet! Hamlet looks at him and says, who in the world are you? I'm Shakespeare. I'm Shakespeare. I'm the guy that brought you into being. This is my story. I'm here to tell you things are going to end well. We would not have known the deep and meaningful things of God had it not been for Jesus Christ coming into our world, and this is what makes John's gospel so significant, is that John is answering the question that everybody has been longing for. Is God real? And if God is real, what is he like? And Jesus makes this claim, and I can tell you right now, 
It's not like any claim that anyone has ever made in history. Unless you're a lunatic. And you know what we do to lunatics, right? We don't remember them. But there's something about the claim of Jesus that separates him from anyone else. You know, Muhammad never said that here in front of you is Allah. You know, neither did, did Buddha say, you know, here I am, the Brahmin in flesh. Confucius never said any of these things. I mean, Socrates never said that I'm that Delphi of oracles come to flesh. He never said that. And yet Jesus Christ makes this claim. You know, Jesus Christ makes these bold claims. When he was on trial, he said to those who were about to persecute him, you will see me when I return to judge the world. You will see me when I return. I mean, who is this person as well, Jesus, who forgives sins, but it's not like the sins that you and I, you know, forgive each other for. Like you took my bike and you brought it back and you said, I'm sorry because you've done wrong to me. And I say, it's okay, I forgive you. I'm talking about a man that wrongs someone else and he says, I forgive you for that. I'm talking about a man that takes on himself the inflictions that are placed on other people. I'm talking about one who sees himself with those who live, who breathe. Jesus says he's one with them because he talks about himself saying, I am the light of the world and this light is the life of all men saying that Jesus is this very life and he's, the, the Greek for life is bios. Jesus doesn't use that word bios when he says he's this life. He calls himself Zoe, essence of life. It's unborrowed life. It's the very source of life. And Jesus saying, because I live, all things live. Because I exist, you exist. He is this life, and John testifies of this when he sees. And Jesus goes on to say that he is this God. He sits up right next to a hill looking down over Jerusalem, and he looks over Jerusalem and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, I send prophet after prophet. Who is this man? that makes these claims that throughout history he's been sending prophets in order that we may be delivered. No one has ever made these claims but Jesus. And he sustains these claims. How did he sustain these claims? The book of John is divided into two parts. The first part of John's gospel is all to do with signs and miracles. This, all these signs are speaking in to what Isaiah talked about. You know you can take the book of Isaiah alone and find the gospel? Isaiah, 66 chapters, like the Bible with 66 books, the book of Isaiah is so powerful that you can find all the topics that, and the themes that you find in the Bible all in this one book. And the gospel is found in there talking about the signs and miracles that the Messiah would do. And Jesus, in the first half of the book, answers to all these signs and miracles, but after these signs and miracles, the second half of the book is about Jesus' conversation with his disciples on a table called the Last Supper. And then from that conversation is his death, and resurrection. Now I want you to think about that. You've got the signs and miracles, and then you've got his final words of hope, and then his death and resurrection. At the heart of the book is the climax. You see, the way that Jewish thinkers, or the way that Jewish would write, is different from uh, the way that Westerners would write. With Westerners, the climax is at the end. 
the, the literary st structure in Jewish culture is a chiastic st structure where the climax is right at the center. And at the center of the Gospel of John is the resurrection of, La of Lazarus. And Jesus makes a bold claim. And I want you to know as well that Jesus has seven titles in the Gospel. He also has seven signs and wonders. You'll notice that John loves the number seven. And at the heart of the Gospel of John, of John is the title, which is right in the middle, the title which Jesus takes to himself. He says, I am the resurrection. I'm the resurrection. At the heart of the gospel is this resurrection. Jesus Christ makes it known to everyone that was around him. Listen, this miracle here is going to be the mother of all miracles because it's going to lead to my death. This is the last straw that broke the camel's back. This right here, friends, I'm preparing you for this resurrection because this resurrection is going to be different from any other resurrection that ever occurred in biblical history. Why? Because everyone else that was resurrected by a prophet was resurrected using the power of God. This resurrection that takes place right here in the heart of the Gospel of John is a resurrection that's taking place because God is right there. And he says to them, I am this resurrection. Which means he is the one that answers not just to death that we call sleep. He says, I am the resurrection. I am the one that can drink the wrath of God and rise again. I am the only one that is going to be able to go taste second death for your sake and rise. No one else will be able to come back from that. Jesus is the resurrection. And he gives that message to his people because it's the one message that will either cause you to flee at the end or cause you to cling to the cross in the end. This resurrection is everything to Christians. As a matter of fact, if you're an atheist and you wanted to go after Christians, first thing you want to do is find out whether Jesus actually rose from the grave. Because if Jesus did not rise from the grave, everything that Christians believe in is over. That's it. The whole faith is hindered on this one event that Jesus Christ really rise from the, from the grave. And if Jesus did not rise from the grave, our faith means nothing. And so Jesus proves that he's the resurrection in the Gospel of John when he revealed himself to be alive. He rose from the grave. And let me tell you something. Do you know that event still puzzles historians today, and I'm not talking about Christian historians, I'm talking about mainstream historians. It puzzles them because how do you explain 500 plus eyewitnesses? How do you explain that? And not just 500 plus witnesses, 500 plus witnesses who are willing to die. And if you were to say they were hallucinating, well, you can palm off that one was hallucinating. You're stretching it when you say two are hallucinating. It's the equivalent, as one psychologist says, it's the equivalent of saying that one person or that five people had the same dream. It's impossible. And so quoting from one historian, he says, it's a lot easier to say that Jesus rose from the grave than to try and deal with the psychological phenomenon of about 500 plus people rising from the grave and oh no, 500 plus people seeing Jesus alive again. Jesus says that he is this resurrection. And so when we go into the story of John in these next few sermons, in the next few series, we're going to be looking at the word becoming flesh. This word is the tabernacle. 
This word is the unseen God made seen. God enables us to see God. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Son of God. He is the Rabbi. He is the Son of Man. He is the Messiah. He is Jesus of Nazareth. He is the resurrection. Jesus Christ. And one thing that you will pick up, and I want to land it here. I want you to think about one thing as we go into the series. Every person that Jesus encountered did not know themselves until they knew who Jesus was. Even when they thought they knew themselves, it wasn't until their encounter with Jesus, and when they encountered Jesus and discovered who Jesus was, that they discover who they were. And I'd like to tell you as well, that you and I will fail every time to try and find out who we are until we discover who he is. And we discover who he is through the person of Jesus Christ. I can't wait to look at the conversations that Jesus had with the woman at the well. The, wo- uh, the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus. The conversation that Jesus has with Peter. These conversations are conversations that has helped shape our constitution. These conversation has helped us shape in the West morals and ethics. William Lecky, who himself is an atheist, said that the person of Jesus Christ has done more to soften humanity than any other teacher, philosopher, or moralist that's out there. Have you had an encounter with Jesus? Do you know who Jesus is? C.S. Lewis ended his diary. Uh, if you haven't noticed, I, I, I love C.S. Lewis. I've like, read, or, uh, like, read almost all 73 of his books. But one of his books that I love the most is his diary. At the end of his diary, he says, I began this journey pursuing this God of the Hebrews. At the end of my journey, I discovered the God of the Hebrews pursuing me. One of the most prominent atheists in Europe becoming a Christian in one of the most challenging times in the 20th century gives each and every one of us hope that any one of us, no matter if you came off the streets or if you're in the books, whatever it is, God can reach us. As Augustine once said, Augustine says that the gospel of John is deep enough for an elephant to swim in and shallow enough for a child to not be drowned. And we're going to be looking at this book. The first time my father ever heard of the story of Jesus, he was one of those who mocked Christianity, hated Christianity. And on his way home, his car breaks down, and inside his car is two items, beer crate and a 20 kg of sack of potatoes. He could only take one of them to the nearest bus stop, and he took his beer crate, left the 20 kg sack of potatoes. Sat down in front of that bus stop, waiting for his bus to come, and the bus doesn't come for another 20 minutes, but within that 20 minutes, the word of God had already been spoken into his heart. That when the bus came, he let that bus go and stayed there waiting for the next bus. He was hooked on the person of Jesus Christ. After three weeks of attending this series from outside the bus stop, he gave his life to God. You will be struggling to discover who you are until you find out who Jesus is. And we're going to be looking at the person of Jesus Christ through the eyes of John.